Let's pray. Father, thank you for this opportunity to gather around your word this morning. Thank you for that which you've placed on my heart. But Lord, I want to thank you so much that your word says that it never returns to your void. It always accomplishes that which you pre-purpose it to do. And moreover, it prospers in that thing. So we bless you this morning. We choose, Father, to open our hearts and our minds and our spirits to hear what your spirit would say. Speak to us today, just like you spoke to me last night at ten past nine, that we may be more like Jesus as we leave this building this morning than when we arrived. And it's in your matchless name we pray. Amen. Have you ever been, <coughs> have you ever been to a, a, a country town? Or perhaps when we were allowed to, although we can again now, we haven't been able to for a while. Have you ever been overseas and just marvelled at, you know, overseas to a place that's got more than 200 years of history? (laughs) Have you ever marvelled at some of the the plaques, you know, established 1762? Or, I mean, you can go to Queen Bean and see established 1906 or something, but have you ever been to those places and been just, amazed at how old some of these things are. I remember being in Westminster Abbey, uh, not that I want to name drop, but we were there in 2015, and I remember as we got on the tour, the guide saying to us, well, you're entering a building where worship has been conducted for nearly 1,000 years. That's a lot of sermons. That's a lot of Lamington drives. Nearly a 1,000 years. It's been the place where every coronation has taken place since 1066. And I remember walking around this magnificent, architecturally magnificent structure. But it is a place of worship. It's not just a tourist attraction. It's a place where worship has been held for nearly a thousand years. And marvelling at the, some of the inscriptions on the, on the graves, the, the headstones in the floor, because there's some profoundly important people who are buried under there. People who've changed or or either made history or changed the course of history. Just marvelled at it. But I want to encourage you this morning, no matter how old that is, that we are part of an unshakable kingdom that was established before time began. Established. Zero. (laughs) Before time began, we are part of an unshakable kingdom. An unshakable kingdom. And we have as our brother, our friend, our master, our saviour, the one who didn't just alter the course of history, he made history. And he continues to do so even this very day. Showing up, walking through walls 2,000 years ago, but coming into our situations day by day. What a wonderful saviour we have. I've recently, just in the last few weeks, been enthralled, I couldn't find a better word, enthralled again by the power of his word and the ability of his word to speak right into our circumstances and give us wisdom and understanding and direction. The Bible says his word is a a lamp to our feet and a light to our path, shows us where we are and shows us how we are to go. Psalm 119, 105. Just been enthralled in a way that is hard to put into words. Just how powerful his word is when we're anchored to his word. There's been many times in our lives where we didn't know what the next day was going to bring. Too many to go into this morning. But I can say to you without without any exaggeration or without any fear of contradiction, that the thing that has sustained us, the thing that has pulled us through, is his word. The life, the power, the majesty, the wisdom, the depth, the richness of his word. Getting called at 11 o'clock at night when we're in the deepest, darkest valley of our lives. And someone who wouldn't even identify themselves. Go and read Psalm X, Y, Z. Verse ABC. 
I've just been praying for you. Re- go and read this passage because I believe this is something for you at the moment. I've got pages of them written down in my office where people have reached out to us. How many know his word is life? How many know that it's sharper than a two-edged sword? So I want to speak to you this morning about being settled or established. So for those who like a title, here it comes. That settles it. That settles it. That's the title of my message this morning. That settles it. And as I was preparing this during the week, I had confirmation after confirmation after confirmation. Even again this morning, hallelujah, that this is what the Lord wants me to speak on. So I don't have any doubt. That settled it. See, we could consider Abraham who waited 25 years. Remember he got the promise and then he waited 25 years for the promise to come to pass. And he and his wife blessed their socks. Even Well, they didn't wear socks in those days. Blessed their hearts, tried to help God along a bit. Notwithstanding that, the promise arrives and then somewhere between 12 and 15, depending on which commentator or theologian you look at, 12 to 15 years later, God says, take the son of promise up onto Mount Moriah and sacrifice him. What did Abraham do? Oh, I wonder if that's God. Could you give me a sign? Could you give me a fleece? No, he set out with the fire and his son and a few helpers. And he was so convinced, so convinced that this is what he was to do. When the son of promise said to him, Dad, where's the sacrifice? He said, don't worry, God will provide. That settled it. It was settled in his heart. We could look at Jesus at the wedding of, at Cana, where he, of course, many of us would know he performed his first miracle. And Mary says to him, hey, Jesus, they've run out of wine. They've run out of wine. This was, this was terrible for the hosts. An unthinkable thing that they'd run out of wine. And she says to her son, Jesus, they've run out of wine. I love what he said. Woman, what's that to do with me? Now, he mightn't have said it in that tone, but woman, what has that to do with me? My time has not yet come. And what did Mary say to the servants? Just do as he says. That settled it. That settled it. Psalm uh, Psalm 119 verse 89 says, His word is settled in heaven, the new King James. The ESV puts it this way, Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. You see, it's settled. It's not subject to rise and fall. It's not subject to change. It's not subject to, oh, change my mind, didn't see that coming. It's not subject to interest rates. It's not subject to our economy, pandemics, world leaders, wars, floods, earthquakes, or anything else. It's settled in heaven. That settles it. The original language here for for fixed or settled means to establish, take one stand, be firmly fixed. In other words, his word is standing firm over you and over me today. It's not subject to the winds of change. Like an immovable sentry, if you like. It is established and it cannot be thwarted in any way. Who can say hallelujah? See, we can stand firm when the winds of adversity blow. How? By being grounded in his unshakable, unchangeable word. Paul put it this way, I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed to him against that day. It's settled. It's not negotiable. No change of mind. God said it, I believe it, that settles it. I simply won't change my mind. This is me speaking now, not Paul. I simply won't change my mind because it's settled. There's certain things in the kingdom that are not negotiable. Jesus died for me, he rose again for me, and he's coming back to take all those who call him Lord to be with him for eternity. That's settled. That's good news today. We've just celebrated, have we not, last weekend, the magnitude of his sacrifice. And the victory of the cross. So glad we sang those songs this morning. To you belong the supremacy. But when he was before Pilate, in answer to the question that Pilate posed to him, are you the king? 
I love what Jesus said. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I've come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. It was settled, and it was established in eternity. It was established for his life. For all time he will be known, he was then and will be out into the millennia as the Lamb of God who took away the sin of the world. It settled. And he wasn't going anywhere until his life's work was complete. I believe when we truly grasp the call of God on our life, whatever that may look like, because it'll be different for each of us, then many of the uncertainties or the variables in the equation, if you will, will be just washed away. We won't be tossed about by every wind of doctrine, as the Bible says. How? I hear you ask. Well, when it's settled in my heart that he only has the best for me, when it's settled in my heart that he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that I could ask or think, when it's settled in my heart that he rejoices over me with singing, when it's settled in my heart that my eye hasn't seen nor has my ear heard nor has it entered into this little brain that which he has prepared for me, it fills me with hope, with godly confidence, not arrogance but hope. The Bible says this anchor we have This hope we have is an anchor for our souls. What is an anchor to do? It stops the boat moving. It stops the ship moving. We're seeing these ships come back into Sydney now. They have massive anchors. The bigger the ship, the bigger the anchor. The bigger the storm, the bigger the anchor. There's no greater anchor than his word for our lives. And when the winds of adversity blow, the anchor is there to hold us and stop us being thrown off course when it's settled in my heart that God is a refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble, then I can have hope. Christ in us, the Bible says, the hope of glory. That settles it. It puts fear, I believe, in its rightful place and smashes a lot of the what-ifs. What I'm hearing a lot around the traps, if you like, a lot at the moment is, oh yes, I know the Bible says that, but. Or I know the Bible says that, but what if? Well, we need to move the buts out of the way and we need to get rid of the what ifs because his word doesn't change. It doesn't change because there's a pandemic. It doesn't change because we've got an election coming up. It doesn't change because we're seeing natural disasters all over the place. My heart goes out to those who've been caught in floods and fires. Please don't hear me incorrectly. But his word is unchangeable. That settles it. And fear needs to be put in its rightful place. What we've seen in the last two and a half years, maybe three, I don't know, two years, is fear's taken uh, an unrightful place in our lives. I'm not talking about being silly or being irresponsible, but I am talking about what the Bible says, that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love and a sound mind. And sadly, in some sections of society and even the church, we've got a big virus, a big V and a little God, little G. God is able to make all grace abound to us. These promises I've mentioned are only a small sample of the over 6,000 promises in his word. Some will say 6, some will say 7,000. doesn't matter. 6,000 is a big number, 7 is only another (laughs) 1,000. Are you with me? There's a lot of promises in his word for us. Whether it's 6 or 7 is immaterial. His word is truth. That settles it. David had defeated the lion and the bear out in the back blocks of nowhereness out in in total obscurity where no one was bowing down to his anointing or singing songs about him. That came a bit later. But he defeated the bear and the lion with his bare hands, no pun intended. Why was it then a surprise to us that he would say to this nine-foot-tall man with armour on and a big sword, who is this uncircumcised Philistine who would defy the armies of the living God? This was just a walk in the park for him. Really? These aren't stories just to tickle our ears. This is God's word. 
I'm sharing with you this morning. It's no wonder he could say, well, all I need is just a sling and a few stones. And he wasn't focusing on the the wife he was going to get or the tax-free living he was going to have. He was just going to take out this guy who's defying the armies of the living God. It was settled in his heart and mind. God is all-powerful. The Psalms say, with my God, David, I think, speaking, correct me if I'm wrong, with my God, I can scale a wall and defeat a troop. My Bible says, with our God, we shall do valiantly. It is he who will tread down our enemies. Not just words on a page or songs for us to sing and I'm resisting the urge. Some of you are smiling. That's good, they're saying. (laughs) With our God we can do valiantly. It is he who will tread down our enemies. Straight from the Psalms. Psalm 60 verse 12. Psalm 40 verse 1, speaking of Jesus, says this. I waited patiently for the Lord. Don't raise your hand. Who who is good in the patience department? I waited patiently for the Lord and he inclined to me. He leaned in to hear what I was saying because he cares for us. If if he's rejoicing over us with singing, I think he cares for us. Wouldn't you? He brought me out of a horrible pit, out of miry clay, and he set my feet on a rock, an immovable rock. Hallelujah. Goes on to say, and established my steps. He established his steps. How then are our steps, our, our steps established or settled? By standing on the rock of our salvation. Standing on his word and being established in his word. Not surprisingly in both the Old and the New Testaments, whilst there are many words in, in the Hebrew and the Greek for our word established. I want to go there this morning. It's not that sort of a sermon. There are many words, but they all have the same meaning. Listen to this. To be stationed, to be strong, to be immovable, to be fastened, steadfast, or to make firm, as we learned earlier. Are you getting this today? Some of you are. That's good. Psalm 16.8 says, I set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will never Never, everybody say never, never never be shaken. So if you're being shaken this morning, let me ask you, have you set the Lord always before you? Is he at your right hand? If not, let's reposition ourselves so that he is. I want to remind us this morning again of the unchangeable, unshakable nature of God and his living, powerful word. John 1.1 1, 1 says, in the, word, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. He was there right from the beginning. I love this passage from the last chapter of Exodus. Listen to these amazing verses, speaking of the glory of the Lord. It says this, Then the, then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord just was in the corner of the tabernacle. No. <laughs> It filled the tabernacle and Moses was not able to enter the tent, get this, because the cloud had settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Imagine coming here this morning and you couldn't get in because the glory of the Lord was so thick you couldn't get into the building. Some of you are excited about that. Throughout all their journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the people of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, they did not set out until the day it was. For the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, and the fire was there by night in the sight of all the house of Israel. Throughout all their journeys. Of course we know, do we not, the cloud represented his presence. How many know it was an old covenant, an inferior covenant to the one under which we now live. Yes? So his master plan, and I love this, his master plan is that this side of the cross about which we've been singing today, again, praise the Lord, his presence 
wouldn't have to be a cloud that rests on the building. He put his presence in each, inside each of us and we would carry his presence wherever we go. Into the workplace, into the, into the marketplace, into the universities, into the camping and caravanning show yesterday in Sydney where we were. Carrying his presence all over the place. Got to keep you awake. See, all the people in the Old Covenant, all the people, the Bible says, all the people saw, his, saw the cloud. How much more in this day and age should all people witness his glory? Because there's a lot more of us carrying it around. It's not confined to a tent or a building. We get to carry his presence around with humility and with integrity and with godly compassion. Not look at the presence of God in me. That's not it. We get to carry his presence wherever we go. And we can make a difference wherever we go. If we're listening to the leading of the Holy Spirit and we're listening to him to say, just reach out and give that person a word of encouragement. Pray for that person. They look like they could do with some prayer. What's the worst they could say? Can I pray for you? The worst they can say is no. And it doesn't stop you doing it anyway. Hallelujah. He lives in us by his spirit. I want to remind us this morning that the power of his spirit is just as effective today as it was when the stone was rolled away. How do I know that? Because there's been too many times in my life. I'm not 22, in case you were wondering. There's been too many times in my life where I've seen his power do mighty works in people's lives. Bringing salvation, bringing healing, bringing deliverance, having demons scream and leave the room. That settles it. That settles it for me. You can't convince me that his power is not as effective today as it was 2,000 years ago when he raised Jesus from the dead because I've seen too much of it. Nobody can convince me that it's not as powerful today. So don't bother trying. That settles it. Let's move on. 2 Chronicles 20.20. 20. This, this, this chapter of 2 Chronicles 20 is just one of my most favourite stories in all of Scripture. I'm not going to, it's a sermon for another day, but suffice it to say this morning. Under the kingship of Jehoshaphat, the Lord defeated the, ar- the enemy armies with worship. No, they weren't singing off key with badly tuned instruments. Listen to what the Bible says. This is nothing short of remarkable. And they rose early in the morning and went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. And when they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, Judah and inhabitants inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God and you will be, here's the word again, established. Believe his prophets and you will succeed. How about that going into battle? You will be established and you will succeed. He appointed men to sing, give thanks to the Lord for his mercy or his love, depending on your translation, endures forever. And then the Lord set an ambush in the enemy armies and they defeated one another. God's people didn't have to raise a sword. All they had to do was go in for three days and collect the booty. Hallelujah. That's a good strategy for war. Again, not just an Old Testament story to tickle our ears. The New Testament says these things are written, what? In the Old Testament so that we would learn. We would be better equipped. Two points here, just in this little bit this morning. Believe in the Lord your God, take him at his word and you will be established. Number two, the power of worship. See, worship isn't just a bit of singing we do at the start of the service. Worship ushers in his presence and defeats enemy armies. I've shared this here before, maybe not in this this building, in another building. And there's a lot of people here who don't know me from a bar of soap, so I'm going to share it again. Sorry for those who've heard it before. But I was driving from Sydney to Canberra. It's probably 20 years ago or a little bit more. And I was feeling uh, very down and depressed. I had the weight of the world on my shoulders and I don't need to go into all the reasons. But I was in my own, on my own in my car. And I knew about the power of worship. 
And I knew that I could just continue down this path, not the road, but this mental path, or I could do something about it. And it was a day when we still had CDs. There it is, 22 years ago. And I put a CD in and no one else was in the car, so the volume was my, my choice. And I cranked it and I worshipped my way out of my depression. I worshipped my way out of my darkness. I worshipped my way out of the, the weight of the world. And it wasn't about my singing, it was about me lifting up a sacrifice of praise because I didn't feel like praising God. I was in a woe is me, everything's coming against me mode. And you mightn't think from my preaching, but that happens to me too sometimes when, when the enemy comes knocking on your door with discouragement. And I worship my way out of it. I got to about Goulburn or Maroolan or somewhere and it's a wonder the roof was still on the car. Hallelujah. We could spend, I always look for a clock, but there isn't one. We need to install one. I've got one here and I've got one here and one here, but I still look for a clock. Never mind. We could spend another hour in the book of Proverbs, but time is racing away. But for now, commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. That settles it. That settles it. Commit to the Lord whatever you do and he will... He will establish your plans. Now, don't raise your hand, but how many of you have made these wonderful plans and said, Father, could you now bless this? Could you bring increase? Could you bring prosperity to this seed that I'm planting? Well, I asked you not to raise your hands and you're being obedient. Let me just tell you that I've done it and it's not the best way to do it. Do it his way and you get his results. Commit your plans to him and then they will succeed. Hallelujah. Trust me, I've tried it both ways. And his way is a lot less frustrating. Let me encourage you with just two more scriptures so you can be even more established, steadfast and unshakable this morning. Isaiah 54 verse 2 says, well-known scripture, enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch, Stretch out your curtains wide. Lengthen your cords. Strengthen your stakes. He's speaking to barren women there in the first part in verse 1. It says this, For you shall expand to the right and to the left, hallelujah, and your descendants will inherit the nations. Do not fear, for you will not be ashamed. Neither be disgraced, for you will not be put to shame. Verse 13, the man at the back's doing well to keep up. Verse 13, all your children shall be taught by the Lord. That's good news this morning. And great shall be the peace of your children. Great shall be the peace of your children. In righteousness you shall be established. You shall be far from oppression. This is God's word this morning for us. For you shall not fear. And from terror, for it will not come near you. Whoever assembles against you shall fall for your sake. And here it is. No weapon formed against you will prosper. doesn't say the weapons won't be formed. They just won't prosper. Hallelujah. They just won't prosper. I love this next bit. You will refute every tongue that rises against you. You shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. We get to refute every lying word that the enemy wants to bring to us. You're delivering it to the wrong guy because it's settled in my heart. That settles it. He said it, I believe it, that settles it. No weapon formed against me, Satan's going to prosper. Take your weapon somewhere else. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. Finally, as we bring this to a close... Colossians 2, verses 6 and 7 says, As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord. Who here this morning has received Christ Jesus the Lord? Nearly all of you. Praise God. As you have received Christ Jesus the Lord. So walk in him, rooted and built up in him. Here it is again, established in the faith. As you have been taught, abounding in it in Thanksgiving. So let me ask you, is his word settled in your heart? 
Or have you got some ifs, buts and maybes? Are you established in the faith, as Paul says here? Well, let me encourage you today, then if you are, come, not, come what may, you'll not only to be able to overcome, but be victorious when these winds of adversity blow. My Bible says God works all things, all things, all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purposes. Romans 8, 28. Let's be a people who bring his word back to the forefront of our lives. Don't have it as a dusty book in some remote corner in your house. Have it up front and centre so that you are reading, feeding daily. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He who feeds on me will never hunger. He who drinks of me will never thirst. Hallelujah. Let's be people to bring his word back into the forefront. I heard it said during the week, you know, that 50 years ago, or in that era, this book had a lot more authority in our society. And that's why preachers of yesteryear could get up and say, the Bible says, because in our society it had authority. Well, sadly today it has less authority because people say, well, that's your book, I've got my own book might be the book of this or the book of that. I'm not going to focus on them today. We're focusing on the word of God. But let's be people who bring not just his book, but his word back front and centre in our society. Because we can make a difference. There's enough people here. Here it is, folks. History was changed with just 11 men. The church began with just 120 people in an upper room. Because they were told to stay there until they were endued with power from on high. Pro- wait there till you get the promise of the Father. You don't know what it's going to look like, but you'll know when it comes. Paraphrasing it a little bit. And the rest, as they say, is history. So there's enough people in this room to make a profound difference if we take him at his word and really get serious about being established in his word. Amen? Amen. Let's raise our faith up to the experience of his word. And not bring our, his word down to the level of our experience to make us feel better about how we are. Yes? If you don't feel established in the word this morning, there's no condemnation. Come and I want to pray with you this morning that you would be re-powered with his word. Perhaps his word has become a little dim light somewhere in your heart. We'll come this morning and let the Holy Spirit blow on that and bring it back to life. Perhaps, see, you don't don't want to be like me. Why is that? Because you want to be the best version of you. Does that make sense? You don't want to be like anybody else. You know, often at a conference we want to, and this isn't a conference, but we go and we want the speaker to, to give us their anointing. Well, they can't give you anything. They can pray and bless what God has already put in you. You see, Moses, God said to Moses, I'm going to take the spirit that's in you and put it on them. He wasn't taking Moses' spirit, he was taking the spirit of God and then putting it in those people. Are you with me? So come if you want to and let the Holy Spirit invigorate his spirit in you and enliven your hunger because nothing would give me greater joy this morning than to have some of you leave here, at least some of you leave here, in re-enthralled, re-enamoured with his word, even as I have been in recent weeks. Choose today to get into his word, allowing it to lead and guide you, bringing strength, victory and hope to your life. If you believe it, say amen. amen. Now, in a crowd of this size, many of whom I don't know, some of whom I have never seen before, It would be remiss of me not to give you an opportunity this morning to either give your life to Jesus or recommit it to Jesus. So we're not here to just have a service and go home. And the chips and the sausages will wait. So if you've never had what the Bible refers to as a born-again experience, Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. 
If you've never had that experience of surrendering your life to Jesus as your personal Lord and Saviour, or perhaps you did when you were 13 and it's been a few years and you've been going to church but you really don't have that intimacy with Jesus that you knew you once had or you see others with, then with every head up and every eye open, I'd just ask you to raise your hand so that I can pray for you this morning. The Bible says, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. So if that's you this morning, not going to labour the point, but it would be remiss of me not to give opportunity for anyone in here who wants to rededicate their life to the Lord or give it to him in the first place. It would be remiss of me not to give you an opportunity to do that. So if that's you this morning, just raise your hand. If not, we'll move on. Okay, let's pray. Father, this morning, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the power of your word. Thank you that there's life in the word. My prayer for us as a people, as individuals, as a church, as a city, as a nation, that we would get back to your word and the supremacy, the authority of your word. It starts as an individual. It's not, going to start, it's not going to start up on the hill up there. It's going to start in our hearts. You can't legislate for relationship. That's an attitude of the heart. So, Father, this morning, in the name of your Son, Jesus, would you come and set a fire in each of our hearts again for your word today, that we would be rooted and grounded in your word, that we would be established in your word, that we may be more again like Jesus. And come what may, we wouldn't be tossed about with every changing circumstance because our feet are firmly standing on the rock of our salvation, Jesus, the living word. Father, I pray for each person here and each home represented this morning that your grace, mercy and peace would be upon us. As we go into this week, May we know more of your presence in our lives and may we be more ready to give it away to those who are yet to know you in your matchless name. Amen. So if you need prayer this morning, if you want to respond to that, now's a good time to come forward. If not, God bless you. God bless you.